We are in a Parashat Noach, where we are uh, reading about the flooding of the world. And uh, this week in Israel, we started getting the rain. So very, uh, very applicable. So, very powerful parasha, where we are uh, introduced to the Hashem's wrath and uh, re- with resulting, with destroying the world, and many other events that uh, come after that, the uh, rebuilding of the population of the world, and then of course going on to the, the dispersion of all the nations when they start to come together against God, and many interesting things. It's uh, quite an f- important parasha for the history of mankind. But very interestingly, we always need to focus on the small words of the parasha to find something that I can apply in my life and learn from that. And if I don't do that, then I miss the point. If I read just the parasha, the weekly portion, just to get a historical fact, I didn't do anything. The Torah is not a history book. The Torah is coming to teach me how I can become a much better individual. Now, when I want to become a better individual, and even if not, even if it's not on my focus about being a better individual, I always want to know how am I doing in the eyes of others. Uh, If I'm a boss, I want to know if I'm a good boss. If I'm a worker, I want to know that I work well. If I'm a husband, I want to know if I'm a good husband. And so forth. We are very dependent on the opinion of the people who are associating themselves with me and the people that I associate with them. Now, of course, everybody likes hearing how great they are. Oh, you're a wonderful worker. He's a great husband. Everybody likes hearing good things, but you don't like hearing when your boss is telling you, you know what, you're one of the worst workers I ever had. And uh, many other things. Don't like hearing your wife saying that you are a bad husband or any other type of comment You don't like hearing that you are not really successful as you think you are. Now that brings us to an interesting concept. Would you want to know what Hashem thinks of you? Ah, I don't know if I want to. Maybe that's not going to come out so good. Can you imagine if Hashem will send in our report? I think you stink. I mean, of course we want to get a tap on the back. Hashem tells you, ah, you, that's why I created the world, because of you. But in many cases, you might not hear that. You might get a complete opposite opinion, and I don't know too sure if I want to hear what Hashem thinks of me. So we got to think of uh, also that. I wonder what Hashem thinks of me. Does he think good about me? Does he think bad about me? I mean, I care what my wife thinks about me. I care what people think about me. Well, not me. I say I. I'm talking about you. I don't care about nothing. I definitely don't care what people think about me because they think whatever they want. But I'm, of course, I'm joking. But I'm saying, I'm not joking, but I'm saying that you want to know what other people think of you. Why? Because if I'm not doing that well, I want to better myself. If somebody's not happy with my performance, whether it's my boss, my neighbor, my spouse, my kid, I want to know that. But it doesn't separate from the fact that when I hear that I'm not as great as I think I am, that it's pretty hurtful and in many cases can be devastating. So, in this case, we want to know what does Hashem Hashem thinks of us. Now, if you're looking in a very general way on the parasha, it doesn't seem like he's looking that great about us. He destroyed the world. If you're looking at last week's parasha, Hashem was pretty critical in saying, I can't take this behavior anymore. I'm going to destroy the world. So it doesn't seem like Hashem is real fond uh, about us. But comes this week's parasha. The world was destroyed. uh, Or one might say purified and uh, was brought to a new beginning. But then the parasha comes and says something pretty uh, heartbreaking that it says clearly that Hashem thinks about us that we're evil. Straight out, Hashem just says that. 
You can find it in this week's parasha, chapter 8, verse 21. Ki yetzer lev ha'adam ra mineurav. I'll read it out for you. I will no longer curse the earth because of man, meaning that the earth was cursed because of man, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. So that's what Hashem is thinking about us. You're evil. So, that, so how am I supposed to now continue functioning in this world knowing that the master of the universe who created me thinks I'm evil? How would you behave if your spouse tells you you're evil, your boss, your neighbor? Well, that's not pretty uh, uh, comforting to know. And to think that the master of the universe says that we're evil? So what does the Torah come to, to tell me? That we were evil, we as a human race, the master of the universe destroyed the world, and after he destroyed the world, he says, yeah, yeah you're still evil. Okay. I need to learn something from that. I either to take it as criticism, either to take it as constructive criticism, either to take it as, you know, maybe Hashem thinks we're evil, so let's just be evil. Maybe that's what Hashem is expecting from us. Now, if you're really looking uh, with, a, with a logical, uh, through a logical lens into the world, <laughs> Hashem knows what he's talking about. All I see is evil. Right? So, who are we kidding? One can easily look around and say, what you of course, everybody's evil. Well, not everybody, but uh, on the surface, it seems like uh, most people are evil. But on the other hand, you can look, in, uh, look at the world from a positive angle, a positive lens, and say, what are you talking about? People are so nice. People, I mean, like, I'm, not, I'm not talking about every individual. But in general, people are nice. They want to help each other. They, 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 they want to do things together. They, want to, they have positive thoughts. I mean, how can you make a, 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 a straight cut and say, no, everybody's evil? Yeah, I can point my finger on a group of people and say they are evil. And then point my, group, my finger at other a group of people and say they're not so evil. And then these are good people. But how come the Torah comes and says, no, the human race is evil? Now again, here we have a language barrier because if we translate from the Torah, the word, the word is evil, but it says ra. Ra means bad, it can be rotten, it can be uh, not good. It's not that, it's, I, I, I don't like always the translation because evil sounds like Hitler. You know, where everybody's like uh, mass murderers. It says the word in Hebrew, ra. Ra can be bad. Ra can be also not that good. But I'm still left with the question, why does, why, why does God say that? Say, I'm not, I wasn't so happy. All mankind is evil, they're bad. So, A, I want to know why Hashem is saying that, and what do I need to take from that? Because when I read the Torah, I need to take a lesson from that. Now, just to get an idea, uh, what we're talking about and around what part of the parasha. So, of course, you know, the major story of the parasha, there's a flood, and uh, it floods the entire world, kills everything. Noah is in the ark for a whole year. Uh, just imagine life on the ark for the whole year. No internet, no Netflix. I mean, what is he doing there all day long? And it wasn't such a, a convenient situation. Being on, a, on an ark with a lot of animals, and, uh, and uh, dealing with the animals. And then what happens? The flood ends, everything comes down, the land appears after a year. Noah opens up the window and it says clearly that he saw a destroyed world. Can you imagine what Noah saw? Imagine now, chas v'shalom, lo aleno, a nuclear war, the whole world is nuked, and you are the survivor, and you open your, your, your bunker, and you look around, and you see a destroyed world. Now, can you imagine what's going on in his mind? Okay. In one way, why, one can easily understand from the text that Noah is very unhappy with the situation, and he, uh, 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 how do you say, he starts a bad habit of drinking, and he gets drunk, and so one can understand he was a little bit depressed. 
you can understand. And he says, okay, I'll just go and get drunk and forget all my problems. I don't need to deal with this right now. I need to now start the entire mankind. I need to now rebuild the entire world. I'm 600 years old. Who has the, the, the hand for that? I wanted to retire. I was hoping to go to Florida. Heard there's a hurricane there. So I was like, okay, I'm used to the water. So Noah is not so happy with the situation. But nevertheless, uh, and why am I saying he's not so happy with the situation? Because the Torah is clearly telling us right after that that he pl planted a vineyard. The Zohar says that it grew, up in, it grew in the same day. And he made wine very quickly, I don't know how, and then he got drunk. Kind of saying like, okay, I don't feel like dealing with this right now, let's get drunk. That's what I understand and many other commentaries. He didn't want to deal with the situation. But right after that, what does he do? He takes the select, selected of the animals that are kosher on the ark and he offers a, 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 an offering, a sacrifice. And the Torah goes in length explaining how he invested, how he took the best of the best, and he really went out of his way and to, to give an offering to the master of the universe. And the Torah is very particular by saying how much effort he put into that. And then, of course, goes back to the tent and gets drunk. Okay. Hashem is so pleased with this action that Noach did about offering the sacrifice that he says, you know what? I'm never going to destroy the world again. Why? Why did Hashem say, you know what? This little act made a huge difference. I'm not going to destroy the world. I have a bigger question. Why did Noach didn't do that before the flood? Why didn't he do that before the flood? Make, a, make an offering to the gods of the, the God of the world, and maybe he will be like, okay, you know what? Forget about it. I mean, that's my question, but Torah is not answering about that. But now we're placed with the question that Noah did an unbelievable act, and Hashem says, you know what? Because of this act, I'm not going to destroy the world anymore. And... <clears throat> the Orach Haim gives an interesting uh, explanation by saying that Hashem says the human race, humans are evil, so there's no point of being angry at them anymore. Kind of like coming to terms by saying, okay, I figured out who I'm dealing with. It's almost like a father that has a mischievous child. And at some point he says, okay, you know, I, I, I got the point. No, no point of punish, punishing him. He's going to stay how he is and, and, and I don't need to punish him for that. But that's the opinion of the Orachim. Uh, kind of like saying, in other words, this is a bad production. <laughs> The, I mean, Hashem produced many things, animals, creatures, and this one, the humankind, human race, eh, didn't come out so great, so no point of being angry at them. Kind of, kind of like Hashem is coming to terms with the situation, what He created by saying, okay, so I'm not going to destroy them anymore. Interestingly, Rashi says on the word mineurav, which again, the trend, don't go by the translation, the translation messes everything up. Rashi says mineurav, Misha'ashu mitna'er, mitna'er means to shake off. Ne'urav means his youth, but it's the same root, na'ar, nun, ein, reish. It's the same root of when you shake something off, mitna'er. That's when somebody, as they say, uh, uh, breaks the yoke, or takes off the yoke of the Torah, or lets loose, or... But Rashi explains, no, that means when it comes out of his mother's womb. That's what Rashi says. The person is, is evil and mean and bad. It's not that it comes later, rather right from the person when the person, the baby leaves the mother's womb. And Rabenu Bechaye explains on that and he says, look, look how obvious it is. When the baby comes out of his uh, mother's womb, what's the first thing that the baby's looking for? To eat. He's looking for the mother's breast right away. To take, give me something. Whoa, 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 you just came out. Stand in line. I once made an observation that, you know, when a human being comes to this world, the nature of the human being is to, what can I take from this world? 
So I don't know if you had the merit to see a baby being born, but babies are born with their hands like that. They're here to take. And when a person dies, I don't know if you had the, the, I don't know if to say the merit, but to, to see somebody die, the hands are always open because you don't take nothing from this world. So Rabbeinu Bechaye says, here's a perfect example. The baby comes out of his mother's womb. The first thing that he wants to take, to do is to, to absorb, to take something away. That's the nature of human. Saying, in other words, that the person comes to the world looking, what, what can he take? The, this pursue after what can I gain, what can I take, which of course manifests in this world is that I want more physicality, more materialism. And that's what both Rashi and Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says, yeah, from the second that the baby comes out from the mother's womb, there's already a streak of evil. You want, what can, what, what can I take? Because <clears throat> later on I will explain to you that Hashem says, min orav, Rashi says, Mishashu mitna'er, when you shake something off. Shem is saying to us, I will explain later more thoroughly, that the evil is not, you don't born with it. You, you attached, it's attached to you based on where you are. And I'll explain that more thoroughly. But let's go back for a second to, the, to just to clarify what we're looking at and present some questions and then continue. So, Hashem says to himself, who should I, uh, who should, why should I be mad at them anymore, right? Because that's what the verse says. I, I, I destroyed the world. I already figured out that the human race is evil. Eh, no point in really getting upset at them anymore, so I'm not going to destroy the world anymore. So Hashem says, who am I, what am I going to get upset at, at this uh, evil individual? I mean, actually, when you're looking at it, evil is a choice. You choose if you want, you're going to be evil or not. You're not upset at a lion killing a deer. That's his nature. He, it was programmed to kill the deer. There's no evil part here. That's the, the nature of the animal. So you can't be upset at the, at, the, at the lion, but you can be upset at a person. That's his choice. You can choose if you want to be evil or not. Hashem says... Okay, there's no point of doing a general uh, punishment. If I need to punish anyone for their evilness, it will be personal. Up until now, I did like, like a collective punishment. The entire human race was destroyed. From now on, when I say I'm not going to destroy the world because of the anger of the evil of human race, if I need to, then I will punish somebody directly and not the entire human race. So, there's an interesting uh, story that will shed a little bit of light of uh, what we're trying to figure out here. So before the story, let me just summarize the, the beginning, that we, what we're trying to understand. We, we understand right now that Hashem thinks that we are evil as a human race. Not me particularly, but as, as a human race, it's a... It's a bad product. When I'm looking at everything that I created, the human race, eh, this is a, in Hebrew we say sugbet. It's like, a, you know, the, how do you call it? When, the what? Second rate. Second rate. No, no, not second rate. Sometimes you go uh, to outlets and you buy like brand names, but it's That's like awesome. defective. Yeah, you, you, why? Because there's a stitch. It's not, but you buy the brand name, but it's uh, much cheaper because the zipper's upside down or something. So, this is defective, such as this is defective, it came out defective. But again, this is not what Hashem is trying to tell us. That's what we perceive when Hashem says that we are evil. So we're trying to understand what is the message behind all that. So I have a little story. There's a story with a, a great rabbi who was the rabbi of the city of Prague, Nodabi Yehuda, that's his name, Rabbi Yechezkel And he was a great scholar, a great Dayan. One day, a person runs into his room frantically, crying, screaming, help me, Rabbi, help me, you gotta help me, I was robbed, I was mugged, don't ask. Well, oh, relax, sit down, what's going on? Tells him, I'm a, I'm a merchant from a, a, one of the villages here, I come here once a week to the city of Pug, and I come to buy produce, and then I take it back to the village and I sell it, that's my business. And I hired a, a driver, 
It was pretty common in that day. You don't own your, your uh, wagon, you don't own your horse. You Like today, you hire a taxi driver or you hire a mover, so you hire the driver that comes with the wagon and the, and the horses. He says, I hired the, the driver. And what happened in all the way, and of course, I'm, I have a lot of money because I need to buy the produce. And then I bring the produce back to my village and I sell it and that's how I make money. On the way, the driver goes off the road, stops the wagon, comes to me. He was a very big and strong man, tells me, take your clothes off. He takes his clothes off, we switch clothes and he tells me, now I'm the, the businessman, you're the driver and we're switching roles. And he took all my money and he made me drive into the city with his uh, horse and buggy and he disappeared with my money. And now look, I have no clothes, I have no money, what am I going to do? Okay, so the rabbi says, okay, call, the, call this person. They're calling the driver who walks in with nice clothes. And uh, he tells uh, the rabbi, I don't know, this guy's look thick. He comes to me in the street and tells me, you stole my clothes, you stole my money. I am the businessman, you are the driver. The guy's he's, he's completely crazy. I don't know what he wants from me. So now the rabbi is he's like, okay, I have two opinions. They're both saying that they are the businessmen. And he's saying he was robbed. He's saying he was crazy. So he tells them, okay, you know what? Come tomorrow, I'll figure it out. Okay. They come to his office in the morning. He doesn't come out to see them. He sits, opens the Gemara, starts learning. Comes the afternoon, goes out to Mincha. They're sitting outside waiting for the rabbi. They didn't eat breakfast. They didn't drink any coffee. They're just sitting there waiting. Comes the afternoon, he goes and learns, prays. Before you know it, the whole day passes, 10 o'clock at night. They're sitting there waiting for him, starving, tired, upset. They're, 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 they're about to go crazy. Then 10 o'clock at night, the assistant, the secretary of the rabbi comes in and says, okay, uh, the rabbi wants to see the driver. So the real driver who stole the clothes and everything gets up and goes into the room. So the rabbi says, take, 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 the clothes, take the clothes off, give him back the clothes, give him back the money and go away from here. So the story comes to tell you that in his essence, you can't change the essence. You can put clothes on, you can pretend you are the driver, you can pretend something you're not. But when you are not thinking because you didn't eat all day long and you're tired and you're not focused on your act, then your instinct is to answer who you really are. That's, you see how genius the rabbi is, who told him, yeah, yeah, sit here for the whole day and wait. So Hashem is telling us, in other words, you can dress nice, you can behave nice, you can pretend you're so pious. I don't buy that. The bottom line is, as we say in Hebrew, the tachles, what is the default? The default, you can pretend, I mean, you can pretend to a certain extent. So, the bottom line is, as Hashem is telling us, in other words, I don't buy your act. I don't buy your clothes, your, your, how you're pretending. I don't buy that, because I know what's inside. Now, the reality is that most people on the outside, very nice and calm and patient and courteous and, and uh, respectful and... But that's not so going on inside. And again, I'm saying in a very general way. I don't think I'm attacking now every human being. I'm just telling you, Hashem is telling us, <laughs> I don't buy the external part that you pretend to be nice or pretend to be uh, courteous or polite or pious. Saying in other words, which is pretty hateful, that the baker says the cake didn't come out so good. That's basically what the text is saying, Right? There's no other way of explaining it. So I need to understand why is the baker telling the cake didn't come out so good? Or in more direct words, why is God, who created us, says, eh, there's a little default here, a little bit, a little defect. So, that's pretty, uh, besides heartbreaking, that's, uh, that's not so easy to uh, think that the master of the universe thinks that we are a defect object. And what, what, am, I, what am I supposed to do with that? That's the message I need to carry now for the, for the coming year. The Torah is telling me Hashem is not so happy with the product. I mean, what am I supposed to do with this? 
And what am I supposed to take from that? How am I going to make myself a better person? If your teacher comes and tells you, you are a loser, that's what my teachers always told me. You're going to end up cleaning the garbage. There's nothing going to come out of you. So at some point I was like, okay, so why bother? I'll just go out and smoke with my friends. So what am I going? What am I supposed to take with this? Hashem is telling me you're, you're a loser and not good for nothing. So what? So okay, so let me be evil. If you're saying I'm evil, so why bother? So I'm already going to stop you here. That's not what Hashem is saying. That's what we understand from the text. So I'm just going to uh, present a few questions and then hopefully uh, settle the matter. Now, if this is what we understand from the text, right? That Hashem is saying etzem leva adam rami nurav. The human beings are evil right from they were born. The, as I told you, the, the, the baker says the cake didn't come out so good. Okay, let's say that is the case. We just read last week that when Hashem finished creating everything in the world, He created the human race, right? He created Adam. What did He say? Nivra Adam betzalmenu kidmutenu. I'll create a man in my image. So what are you saying, Hashem, that you are evil too? That doesn't work. If you said that you're going to create a man in your image, in your form, so you're not saying that we're evil. Because that will be that you're contradicting yourself. And if you mean that we are evil, that means you're saying on yourself that you are evil, right? So that's the first question. More than that, this should be fresh in your mind, because we just read it a few days ago. When Hashem finished His creation, if you remember, day one, when Hashem created the heaven and the earth, what does it say at the end of the paragraph? Vayar Hashem Kitov. Hashem saw that it was good. And everything that Hashem created, Vayar Hashem Kitov. Hashem saw it was good. And when He finished His creation, meaning, what was the last thing to create? Human beings. Vayar Hashem Kitov Me'od. Hashem saw that it's very good. So how are you saying they were evil? What, you contradict yourself? So we have already two questions that kind of put us in a place that that doesn't make sense, that Hashem will call us evil and bad, or a defective uh, product. Now, another question you have to look at the Hebrew. Ignore the English. The English will confuse you. In Hebrew it says, that we evil from his youth. That's what the translation. What did the translation say? Man's heart is evil from his youth. Right? It's not a good translation. The word in Hebrew is ne'urav. So, if this is the case, so it means that we are evil from we're when, only from when we're young or evil, just evil? It doesn't say, Yetzer leva adam ra, mean that you're bad or evil. Minu rav, why are you adding this name, this word? So are we evil or it's just like a, a something external? So... Really what we're, what, we're, what we're left here with is that we read the text, it seems like Hashem is very unhappy, but now very quickly with a few questions, it doesn't make sense that Hashem will say that we're evil, because it's then he's kind of giving a bad reputation to himself. So, and one last question, by the way, is that last week's parasha, Hashem says that we're evil and he's going to destroy the world, Right? And this week's parasha, he says, we're evil, but he's not going to destroy the world because we're evil. So what changed your opinion over the weekend? <laughs> not the weather. So again, just another question. So, you know what, I actually want to start with answering the third question, then the first two. What happened to change Hashem's uh, opinion? I mean, this is, uh, this is verses from the Torah. It's not that it's a, it's a commentary. Last week's parasha, it says clearly that Hashem says, human race is evil, they're bad, I'm going to destroy them. And this week's parasha, no, I don't think I'm going to destroy them anymore. They're evil, but I'm not going to destroy them. So what changed overnight? What changed is, excuse me? Exactly. What changed it? That Noah did a good act. 
That, that, you're correct. That's what changed the entire overlook of Hashem. Noah did a good act. He came out of the ark, completely depressed, completely with no energy to do anything. Who wants to do something now? Start building the world. But he takes all of his uh, effort, all of his time, all of his energy, and he offers a sacrifice. And I told you the Torah goes in length, how he built a beautiful altar and took the best of the animals and so forth. The Torah even says before that, that he took enough kosher animals to have what to sacrifice when he comes out of the, the ark. Because he took, from all the animals, he took a pair. But from kosher animals, he took seven. But nevertheless, yes, yeah, something as simple as this sacrifice changed Hashem's mind. Completely. But why? Because Hashem changed his position, how he looked at the human race, in order to show us how powerful the, not the tshuva, is sacrificing. Now, the Torah is talking a lot about sacrifices. Physically, we don't do any sacrifices in our day now. I'm talking about animals, but you sacrifice many things every day. You know what it is every morning to go one hour and pray? I can have another hour of sleep. That's a sacrifice. Everything that I do, that I can do something else for my benefit, that's a sacrifice. Hashem wanted us to understand the power of sacrificing. You know how many times I want to do something evil, but I don't do that because I want to sanctify the name of Hashem? Or sometimes I don't feel like doing things. But I'm still doing it in Hashem's name, in Hashem's honor. I'm doing it to Hashem. That's sacrifice. And Hashem loves when we sacrifice things. When we give in. So when Noah did such a little act, Hashem says, that's going to be my model. I'm going to be able to show the human race that if you sacrifice, you give in from yourself. Because really, I can, I can relate with Noah. You open the, the, the window... I would close the window and go get drunk too. Who wants to deal with this world right now? And Noch puts his, and again, this is my commentary, puts his uh, depression aside. He puts his, uh, like, uh, I don't feel like doing this aside. I mean, each and every one of us, many times, you wake up in the morning, you look at the clock, you wave it off, you put the cover on your head, and like, today I'm not doing anything. I don't want to do nothing today. Today I'm just going to be in bed, watching Netflix series, or just sob in my misery, or... <laughs> so Noach is the same, what do you think? Noach is different from anyone. But nevertheless, Noach goes out of the ark, does a huge act of sacrifice, and God says, this is going to be the sign that I will show the human race the power of sacrificing, that you're giving in from your benefit, from your pleasure, from your time, to do something to somebody else. And that's answering what changed Hashem's mind very quickly. That Hashem says, you know what? Evil, evil. But deep down inside, there's something good. There's good potential. Maybe on the outside, a person can be evil. Maybe he's grouchy. Maybe he's tired. Maybe he's upset. Maybe he's depressed. But deep down inside, must be something good there. So Hashem says, okay, you know what? Maybe it's a defect uh, product, but there's something to work with. We can do something good here. I'll tell you a quick story that I heard not too long ago, and you'll kind of see uh, the connection. And not only that, it will emphasize Hashem's decision. If you remember, I'm sure you do, about two years ago, there was all the lockdowns and many restrictions, not only in Israel, everywhere in the world. And there was a period of time that we saw horrible things that people were uh, uh, prosecuted and dealt with horrible ways because of very minor things. And there was a story, it's a st true story, about a young couple that uh, fell in love and they wanted to get married. The groom was not an Israeli, the, the wife was Israeli, the groom was uh, from a different country. And they planned a big wedding, and of course, you know, most exciting day of the, of the person's life, etc. 
And then, of course, the government came with all these uh, stupid regulations. You can't have weddings. You can't be in a wedding hall. You can't do this. You can't do that. S suddenly, suddenly, from a big uh, planning of a wedding, they had to do something very limited. And I'm telling you the short version of the story, just so we can continue with the class. But the bottom line was that they end up having a 30 people uh, uh, wedding in somebody's apartment. Okay, you know, I can understand you. It's a dream of a bride all her life to have a beautiful big wedding. Suddenly you're doing it in some dinky apartment somewhere. Nevertheless, they did the wedding. Everything went well. There was a little bit of noise, a little bit of music. And somebody calls the police. And suddenly they hear knocks on the door, police cars downstairs. And they don't know what to do. So the groom tells to the bride... You know what? Let's go down. I'm with the tuxedo, the jacket, whatever. You with the gown. We'll just tell them it's a small wedding. Ah, they'll, they'll let us go. They don't have compassion. What, are they going to punish now a, a bride? So the groom and the bride goes down. And the police stops them. Freezing cold winter. They're downstairs. No, nothing to wear. Don't let them up. They scare everybody off. Give them a huge fine. Completely destroy their, their, their day. Nobody was left. Everybody was getting tickets there. They shut down the, the, the 20, 25, 30 people wedding and the bride and groom ruined their day. Okay. Baruch Hashem, life goes on and half a year later, uh, and again, I'm telling you a very short version of the story. You can already imagine the feelings and the disappointment and the anger and so forth. Half a year later, some, uh, the father of the groom, I believe, called the groom and said, listen, there's this young guy who just called me and he wants to ask for mechila, for forgiveness from you. He says that half a year ago, he's the one who called the police and he's the one who reported you. He thought it's a big wedding. He didn't know what's going on and blah, blah, blah. And he wants to apologize. So the groom and the bride are like, <laughs> No. So the young man who called and asked for forgiveness, why did he ask suddenly for forgiveness? He was a young yeshiva bacher who was uh, looking to get married. And from that day to the next half a year, he didn't even get one offer from any matchmaker to any shiduch. And he understood from that 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 was the turning point. And because of that, because he ruined their wedding, then he can't find a shiduch. And he wants to ask for mechila, for forgiveness. So the bride and groom says, no, no, no forgiveness. We're not forgiving. He ruined our wedding for no reason. We're not forgiving. Okay. Would you forgive? Yeah? yeah. Right. <laughs> for that reason, for sure. So the husband goes and prays and meditates and ponders. And he comes to the conclusion that he says, ah, everything is from Hashem. It was supposed to happen. He, uh, he tells his wife, let's just forgive him. What's the big deal? I mean, I mean uh, he's just a messenger. He's a nothing. I mean, uh, it's Hashem's will. Everything was Hashem's will. So we were supposed to have a, 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 a bad wedding night. Hopefully we'll have a great life together. And he softens her up and they decide to forgive him. They call him up, we forgive you, we give you a mechila, etc., etc. Okay. And again, maybe I'm butchering some of the details. I don't remember if it was the same day or a day later. The sister of the bride comes frantically to the house. Quick, quick, quick. There was a car accident. Your wife was in a car accident. And they go down. They see the car is all smashed. And he runs to the hospital. It's all a true story, by the way. I'm not trying to hear it now to... Uh, Okay, and in his mind, he's like, Oh my God, this three-car accident. What happened to my wife? And he's the only one who knows that his wife is carrying a child, a baby. He runs into the ER and he sees his wife sitting there all happy, everything is good. And he's like, of course, you okay, what's going on? And, uh, and then, of course, the doctor says there was a huge miracle. She's fine, the baby in the stomach is fine. There was some type of miracle because the collision was front and somehow the airbag didn't open. And if the airbag would open, it would hit her in her stomach, she would for sure lose her, the, the baby. There was some type of miracle that stopped the airbag from opening, and needless to say, nothing happened to her. Another miracle. 
So the groom says to himself, I know what caused the airbag not to open, that we forgave that person. We did a sacrifice. We could have hold on to our anger and our ego. And, and he ruined our wedding night. But we decided to let go. We decided to give in, to forgive. We did a sacrifice here. Then it affected right away an unbelievable miracle that saved the wife and the future baby. So you see what's the power of sacrificing and giving in. Sacrifice is not necessarily to take a bull and go to Bet HaMikdash. It's to sometimes, it's to back off and saying, okay, forget about my pride, my honor, my ego. Like you said, for do for him. I'm going to hold now anger. Let the guy get married. If he, if he feels that's a block for him, why are you holding back? Why are you so tough? The sacrifice of Noah was the birth of good in the human race. Because up until then, according to the Torah, nobody was good. The human race was all messed up, robbing, cheating, stealing, killing, doing everything immoral that can be possible, to a point that Hashem says, I had it up to here. I'll just destroy them all. And Noah, with his little act, changed it for all generations. Saying, in other words, Noah's sacrifice is the birth of the good and kindness of the human race. Hashem says, I found the essence of the human. The outside maybe is bad, the behavior, the thoughts, the desires, but the essence is good. Saying, in other words, that the evil that Hashem is talking about is an addition. It's attached to the human. It's not part of the human. It's not the essence of the person. It's just attached to it. An appendage. Like an appendage. Exactly. Something that is being attached to it. It's not nature. It's not natural. It's not something that we're born with. And how do you see that? Because a human being has a conscious, has common sense. Not only that, uh, most human beings, they want to do good. Maybe the situation they're in doesn't allow them. But a human being has a conscious. And you know how you know that? That the conscious, the common sense, all this? Because human beings only regret the bad things that they did. Did you regret ever something good that you did? I mean, I can come up, when I was thinking about it, have I ever regretted something good that I did? Then it does come up to your mind that maybe you helped a person and then went against you and I should have helped him. Right? But really when you're thinking to the core of it, bad things you regret you did. Good things you don't regret that you did. You went and uh, 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 got yourself a trade in college. You regret it. You invested in a business, it made well, whatever. You regret something good that you did. You helped a person. People don't regret good things that they did. They regret bad things that they did. So what is Hashem revealing to us? When it says the word, Urav, Hashem is telling the, the reasons are from uh, are the surroundings. Okay? That the person might end up being evil or bad or rotten because what's around him. If you put the person in the right environment, then they don't have any reason to be evil or bad. And what causes the person to pursue materialism, honor, respect, power, money, is the surrounding. That's what Hashem is uh, revealing to us. That the evil is not really me. Yeah, we all have evil in us. One person is jealous, another person is uh, quick to ang anger, another person has a lot of desires. And so we all, we all have a lot of evil in us. I can get angry very fast, I can be judgmental, and so forth. I'm not going to start analyzing it. We all have evil in us. But Hashem says, you're right. But it's not you. You have it in you, but it's not you. It's another entity, another power that disturbs you. And there's a reason for that. Because Hashem wants us to work hard to overpower it. Hashem wants us to do tshuva 
to repent. Hashem wants us to grow. If everything would be good, how would you grow? Spiritually and emotionally. You have to have some type of challenges. And you have to have difficulties and, and all sorts of things that will cause you to fight with yourself. If Hashem wants you to work on your jealousy, then Hashem will put you in a very upscale neighborhood where everybody has money and everybody has beautiful cars and beautiful homes and you are driving a 1987 Honda Civic. He wants you to work on your jealousy. So you have a jalopy and everybody else is driving BMWs and Mercedeses. If not, he wouldn't put you there. So Hashem knows what you need to work on and he puts you in that environment. So if I now become an extremely jealous person, which I will uh, translate it right away to evil, then it doesn't mean you are evil. Hashem gave you a scenario. Now work on your jealousy. Be happy with what you have. Be appreciative. Maybe work harder. Maybe be honest in business. You'll get what you want. There's a book. I don't know how it's called in English. Um, it's translated to Hebrew. It's called The Five Regrets. Chamesh Charatot about a certain nurse or a doctor, I don't remember all the story, that she works in some hospice, and she made some type of a documentary slash journal slash, slash research with people that are about to die. Old people, sick people, and so forth. And came out with some type of a conclusion when a person, it it's, it's not limited to a Jew, non-Jew, a Muslim, it's Christian, it's not limited to, to religion, it's a human being. And the whole point was to, to, to understand a person that knows they're about to die, what's going on in their mind. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Right? Excuse me? Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Yeah, exactly. I, I read the translation. I don't know the English version, but yeah, she's the author. And to make a long story short, she calls it the five regrets because talking to people, they're about to die. What do you regret? So the regrets were all the same for all the people. I should have spent more time with my family. I should have uh, uh, be a more happier person. I should have been more appreciative to what Hashem gave me, and so forth. But one comment that she said there, that nobody regrets that they weren't rich. People regretted the fact that they didn't show affection to their wife, or affection to the kids, or spend more time with their kids. It was all in the same type of line. But nobody said, oh, I regret I wasn't rich in this world. That's, who cares? But what was the conclusion from that? That the materialism is evil. Most people run after materialism, and the materialism doesn't have to be a fancy car. It can be also honor and respect and famous. Now everybody wants to be the most famous person in the world. Everybody's walking in the street with a phone. You know, I, 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 have, I want to have 20,000 likes, 20,000 thumbs up. Who cares over your stupid dance? That's what most people do. It's actually pretty pathetic. Everybody wants to be the next big hit. Walking with the phone, TikTok, schmickmock, all this nonsense. How many likes I get, how many thumbs up I get, how many views I get. So everybody will go to the extent of doing the most foolish things or the most degrading things to get more likes. That's how pathetic it is. So that's also uh, the pursuit of materialism. It's not necessarily a beautiful car or money. It's attention. I want to be famous. I want to be liked. I want everybody to like me. So the reality is that the materialism, it's evil. <clears throat> so when Hashem says the word mineurav, which is translated into his youth, the real meaning is the pursuit of materialism of honor and pleasure and respect, that's when the person becomes evil. When he starts pursuing all these evil things. If you don't pursue these things, you're not going to be evil because you're going to pursue good. You're going to go after helping people, after being kind and charitable and doing positive things. When do you become evil? When is the title of a human being evil? When you start pursuing all these physical pleasures. Materialism and money and honor and respect and famous and whatever it is. <clears throat> and like I told you, it's, it's very interesting because in the previous parasha, if you want to see exactly where it is, chapter 6, verse 5, it says very clearly, 
כל מחשבות ליבו רק רע כל היום. All the thoughts of the humans are bad all day long. Can you imagine if you had some type of a device that you aim at a person and know what they're thinking of? Oh. I told you already, there's a great, great rabbi from World War II, the Rebbe from Piasetzna, who has a, 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 a type of a, a, a meditation method, which I explained that in length in other classes, it's called Hashkata, when you're silencing your thoughts. He's basically saying that most of our thoughts are not our thoughts, And if you're able to meditate and bring yourself to a point that you're silencing the thoughts that are coming into your head, what is left? Your thoughts. And then you're able to think clearly. And needless to say, get divine uh, uh, messages. But he was saying also in the same line, if you would know what people think all day long, you would think people are completely deranged. If you would be able to, to, to tap into another person's thoughts, you say that person is completely crazy. But that's the reality. Can you imagine having a device that you're aiming it at a person, you know what they think? They might smile at you. Oh, you look great today. I don't want to tell them what's going on in the thought. And needless to say, other situations. So last week's parasha, Hashem says, all day long, the thoughts are evil. I'll read you the translation. And the Lord saw that evil of man was great in earth and every imagination of his heart was only evil all the time. So Hashem read our minds and says, all you're thinking about is bad and evil things, which I do believe that up until today, the majority of people in the world, that's what's going on in their mind all day long. Excuse my language, but who can I screw? Who can I steal? Where can I get this? How can I use him? How can I use that? How can I do this? That's what's going on in people's mind all day long. So interestingly, when it says the word mineurav, Hashem is kind of res- limiting and restricting how much evil. Last week's parasha, he thought, okay, all the time evil, all day long. But now Hashem says, okay, I take it back. Minurav, when the person is focusing on something evil, then that's when he starts becoming evil. That's why Rashi says, mitnaer, when you shake something off. You get a certain education at home and you say, I don't want to do this anymore. You get a certain... Uh, 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 how do you call it? Not an education, a certain... I uh, forgot the, the, the word. In Hebrew you say ashkafa, a certain way how you look at things. Uh, an outlook. You know, you raise a child in a certain way and then they just shake it off and they go off and do whatever they want. The whole point of Hashem saying what He said is to limit the evil... To a way that we can understand that evil is not uh, genetic. It's not part of me. Yeah, there is evil. Shem says, don't, don't get me wrong. There is evil and evil in you. But when Hashem adds this little paragraph, it's to tell us, yes, but it's not genetically. You're not born with that. That's not you. In many cases, if you're going to tell a child now, you're, you're stupid, you are unsuccessful, You're not good for nothing. The child will grow like that. So the child or uh, the individual might say, yeah, I'm evil. Everybody tells me I'm evil. Yeah, you, it's not you. There is evil in you, but it's not you. And that's very, very important because a lot of people think that they're losers or they're not good or maybe the society is telling me that I'm not okay. They must know. Unfortunately, this evil... It, why did I tell you before that it becomes because of your surrounding? Because what creates a lot of these emotions is the, the competitive situation that a person is being put in. And unfortunately, I don't know how it is 100 years ago, 200 years ago, but in the last 50 years at least that I am alive, I can tell you that everywhere you go, the competition causes a person to do bad things because you want to be number one in class. You want to be the best in this, the best in the sport that you're doing. So this competitive emotion causes some people to just be better and in many cases it causes a lot of people to cheat to, and to do bad things. Because I want to be the number one. I want to be the best. I want to be the strongest, the fastest, the greatest. Now if I can't do it naturally, then how is, how, what's my other option? Well, I have to cheat. 
And you see it in everything, in business, in politics. If I want to be better, then I put you down. And I'll slander you, I'll trash you. Not caring that it's destroying your life, but at least I'll get to be the best. That's the evil that, it's not me, but my desire to be so successful and great, this competitive emotion that it causes me to be evil. Competitive, jealousy, that's the problem with many of the people in our generation, this, the, the jealousy. I want to be good like him. I want to be successful like him. I want to be famous like that. Now, if you can't do it naturally, then you have to start cheating and changing your ways and so forth. So just to continue, <clears throat> Hashem is telling us, in other words, there is evil in the world. There is evil in you. But when ad adding the word mineorav, the evil is not you. It's in you. It's part of you, but it's not you. So on that comes an interesting question. There was a debate between Rabbi Yehuda Nasi and his good friend Antoninos. They were very good friends. They were, uh, uh, would learn together, philosophize together. One time, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi asks Antoninos, when do you think the, the evil in the person is created? Okay, they're both thinking. And Antoninos says, what do you think? He says, I think when it's time of the... Uh, fertilization. The second there's a fertilization, that's it. The evil is already being placed inside. So Antonino says, no, I think when the baby goes out to the, from the mother's womb. And Rebbe tells him, you know what? You're right. I was wrong. You are right. The evil comes into the person the second he goes out of his mother's womb. And saying in other words that the, the evil is not born with, it's from the surrounding. You don't come out of the womb with that evil. You, you take the same baby and put it in different places, you'll get a totally different person. And Rebbe told Antoninus, you're right, it's, it's when the baby comes out of the world. <clears throat> and the verse that we're reading is basically coming to tell us, it's coming to narrow and to limit evil. Because unfortunately, many people, when they think they are bad, they'll, that's how they will behave. I remember when I had little kids, I mean, I still have little kids, but when we started a, a family, then some lady told my wife, oh, always call your child a tzaddik and a chacham and, and I was like, yeah, but he's not a tzaddik. No, 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 call him always a tzaddik, like a righteous person, because when you constantly tell them these building uh, uh, words and you're good and you're smart and you're good, and you're, then it be, you, you take it out from them. And if you call the person, ah, you're a shlemazel, a shlumil, a loser, you are the, then that's what you bring out from the child. Which, interestingly, the Baal Shem Tov says something similar to that, he says, what's so bad with Lashon Ara? Besides, Lashon Ara means to slander, to gossip. He says, besides that it's a prohibition from the Torah. He says, when you talk bad about another person, you arouse that bad in that person. If I say about a certain individual, ah, oh, he's such a crook, he's a thief, he's a phony, then I, in, I in, empower that in that person. So same thing here. Kadosh Baruch says, I need to limit how much evil, how much power the evil has. You need to increase the good, then limit the evil. Then really it seems like a lot, of pers a lot of people might be evil and bad. And again, evil is not the right word because the word the Torah is using is ra. And ra can be bad, mean, uh, aggressive, rotten. It can be many words. Don't get hooked on the word evil. Saying in other words that yeah, on the surface, if we're talking practically, I can probably look at most people in my life and see a lot of evil. He's jealous, he's cheap, he's angry all the time, he's judgmental. It's very easy to point uh, on a person and, and see the evil. Most people can easily look at other people and see the evil. And by the way, when people look at you, they also see evil things. In your mind, I'm evil? Pfft. I'm not evil, I'm a good person. But some people might look at you and perceive you as evil or bad or mean. 
So really the evil is something external and what's underneath is always good. The essence is good. And again, I'm excluding now Hitler and Haman and Hezbollah and murderers. I'm, I, I, don't catch me on my word. A lot of people now will twist my words. I'm a normal people. Shem is coming to tell us in very simple words, don't confuse between yourself and the evil that's in you. It's a big thing. I, have, I know what I'm, what's bad in me. Okay? I'm talking about right now about myself. I know the bad things that I have in me. I know it's not going to share it with you. I know you want to know, but I'm not going to share it with you. The same way that you know what's evil in you, or bad or rotten in you. We all have bad thoughts, or bad intentions, or desires that are not so appropriate, or whatever it is. I know it's bad in me. I know my weaknesses. I know what's, what draws me to do things that are not good. I, I know. Whether I do it or not, it's irrelevant. I'm not saying that now I do everything that I want, or do everything that I think. But I know the deficiencies in me. I know the lacks in me. That might bring me, if I don't have a strong uh, personality, that might bring me to a place of saying, my second grade teacher was right. I am bad. <laughs> and Chas Shalom bring me to a place by saying, I, I can never be successful. I can never achieve this and that. I can never do this and that. I'm bad. I'm lazy. They're all telling me I'm lazy. My last boss told me I'm lazy. So, Hashem is coming and telling you, separate between you and the bad that is in you. The bad that is in you is your, so to say, your trigger to become better. Because if I wouldn't have any bad in me, so what, what better would I try to be? I will just be me the same way. That's not what Hashem created me. Hashem created me to grow. Spiritually, emotionally. So again, I'm nailing it in. Hashem is coming and telling you, don't ignore the bad, but don't confuse the bad between you and the bad that is in you. Hashem is saying, in other words, the bad is external and inside is what I can work with, that you can fix, you can change. Because the inside is not bad. And again, I can only talk about myself. So if I go back now 25 years, 30 years, yeah, I can define myself as the ultimate rotten, rotten human being, evil, bad. So it means I'm bad. I mean, I did some pretty bad things in my life. So what's this bad? The bad is external. The bad is from the surrounding. The bad was from jealousy, competitiveness, and so forth. So there is bad. But it's not the real real essence of me. And is the, all the bad removed? No, there's still bad. We're going to have it till the rest of our life. But the bad is external, not the inside. Rambam gives an interesting explanation on that. And he says, when a man uh, doesn't want to give a divorce to a wife, a get, what do you do? So you send a bunch of goons and you beat him up. Till he will agree to give it. So he didn't agree to give it. He just got beaten up. So he, just want, he doesn't want to get beat up again, so he gives it. Right? That's the common sense here. Rambam says, no, 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 no. What causes him not to give it is ego, pride, vengeance, hate. You beat him up, you get the evil out, he comes to his senses. What am I talking about? I'm a, you, I'm a good Jew. Let, let it go. Go find yourself somebody else. I'll find myself another woman. So Ramam says, you beat, you beat him up to, to come to his senses. Because the only reason why he wouldn't give it to her is ego. Or pride or hate or whatever it is. Other than that, when you come to your senses, what, what, why am I holding her? I don't like her. Go. Who needs you? And even if I like her, you don't like me, so Go. I'll conclude with a story, and hopefully that's going to bring us to our senses to understand the, 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 the message that we're trying to get and apply. So there was a famous murder case in the United States, and all the evidence showed that the person is the murderer. They brought the detectives, they brought the 
the, how do you call it, the, the material from the investigation, the, the whatever witnesses they had. Very big murder case. And everybody was convinced that is the murderer. So on the, the how do you call it, when the lawyer gives like the last uh, speech or whatever it is, so the defense of the, uh, the lawyer that is defending the murderer comes and says, listen, I know you think my client is a murderer, but I want you to count till 30, and in 30 seconds, the real murderer is going to walk through that door. <sighs> oh, the court is like going, wow, wow. They're all counting, one, two, three. When they get to 30 seconds, everybody looks to the door to see the real murderer. Nobody comes in. So the lawyer tells everybody, you don't really think that my client is a murderer because you all looked. If you would think he's the murderer, you wouldn't look. Since you all looked, you're not convinced that he is the murderer. Okay, so the jury walks out, they talk, they come back in, and the jury finds the defendant Guilty. Yeah. Oh, order in the court. Wow, how? So the head of the jury, there's always one person who's like the in charge, he says, you're right. Everybody looked through the door waiting to see the real murderer. But there was one person in the entire room that didn't look. Your client. Because he knew he is the murderer. If he wouldn't be the murderer, he would also look. No. So, just to conclude, we recognize ourselves with the evil. You will recognize your evil in you. And you'll do your homework if you need to, if it doesn't come up to your head right now. Like I told you before, I know the evil in me. Whether it's under control or not, it's irrelevant to this class. But I know my evil streaks. I know the bad in me. I'm talking about me, myself, right now. Oh, I recognize the bad in me in a second. I cannot fool myself. So don't fall in the trap of the Yetzer Hara when it comes to try to tell you you're evil, you're not doing God's work, you are not a good Jew, you're not a good follower of Hashem, you didn't wake up to Minyan, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, you don't follow the Torah, who are you pretending you think you are? That's the Yetzer Hara telling you, you're evil, you missed the Minyan, you didn't give charity, you didn't learn Torah, you're pretending to be so pious, you're not! But that's the trap of the Yetzer Hara telling you, you are evil. So don't let the Yetzer Hara confuse you between you and the evil in you. And that's the message Hashem is coming to tell us. There's evil in you, but it's not you. It's just coming to be a fighting power. And when Hashem added the word, Mineurav, it's when you are so to say, triggered to be evil. Your honor was stepped on. Your ego was stepped on. Somebody took from you. Somebody's better than you. Somebody more successful than you. You are, so to say, drawn to do something evil. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't confuse. You are not evil. Think very well before what you are about to do. Change the way how you think. Change the way how you, your emotions are driving you to do something. Most of the bad things that you do is because something triggered it. Something triggered you to slander that person, to raise your voice, to raise your hand, to steal, to cheat. Why? Because that evil in you was triggered. triggered. And again, going after the materialism, the honor, the respect, the ego, the desire, the I want. I have to be the winner. I have to be the best. I have to be superior to you. Hashem is coming and giving us a powerful message by saying, don't confuse between the evil that is in you to be there as an assistant for you to grow higher 
And don't confuse it that you are evil and chas v'shalom, fall into despair and say, I can't do this. I'm not as great as I thought. I'm not so successful as I thought. I'm not going to be able to achieve whatever my goals are. Don't confuse yourself between you, which the essence is good, with all the abilities. Hashem gives you all the abilities to do whatever you need to do. But don't confuse it with the fact that you are a failure, chas v'shalom, or evil or bad. That's not you. Zad Hashem. Hashem should bless us all to be aware of our evil, bad, and not the positive things in us and to understand what do I need to do? Why did Hashem give me something evil or negative as jealousy and to that person to hate and to me whatever it is judgmental and that person to be whatever pursuing after money if Hashem gave you a certain I have to call it even a trade or a personality if Hashem gave you something evil in you is for you to realize what you need to do not to apply it and to nourish it, but what do I need to do? Where do I need to work on myself? How do I control this, these evil thoughts, these evil desires, these things that are negative? And to remember what Hashem is telling you. Don't fall into the trap of the Yetzir Ara that you are the evil one. You'll never be able to do tshuva. You're not the evil. You're good. <coughs> the evil is external. Just eliminate the evil. And if you might want to know how do you eliminate the evil, is you just increase in good. You cannot eliminate the evil. You'll never be able to. Same thing the other day, somebody asked me about what's going on in the world, and the evil governments, and blah, 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 blah. We should go and fight them. I said, who are you going to fight? Think you can fight something? So the only way what you can fight is increasing light in the world. That they bring darkness into the world, then you have to increase the light in the world. That's it. I'm not going to fight now governments and evil families and you can't. But you can increase light in the world, increase good in the world and the light always will diminish the darkness. <laughs>